very much, and thank you for having me here today. I'm going to speak briefly about a topic that to me I think is very interesting for an audience such as this, where if you've noticed many of the presentations that have preceded mine and that will follow mine have focused on urbanization and on increases in the numbers of people living in cities, so urban growth. But in the United States, and in fact most developed countries, uh, a new phenomenon that we are now dealing with involves the decline of population. And so in the US and Western Europe in particular, we have tended to focus on population decline in cities. Although uh, without a doubt, especially in the US, it's a question of regional population decline as well. But today what I'll focus on is, is decline in cities and then talk a little bit why I think that it might be interesting to give a consideration to human capital stock within these places. So here we have a map of the 48 contiguous United States. So we do have two more states, but they are not shown on this map. And what you see in orange are the cities uh, over 100,000 in 2010 that had lost population. And I'm not sure how clear the legend is to you, but of course, if you look at the, pop at the blue circles, those cities that have, that have seen increases in population over the past 10 years, that of course the rates of increase are much, much more extreme than what we see in terms of decline. So when places, when cities lose population, they're only losing at a most maybe a third of their population and that is an extreme case. We're talking about places like Detroit, Michigan when we talk about a decline like this. But there are a few things that I'd like to draw your attention to here that I think frame the discussion a little bit. The first is that you'll notice that it's not, a, it's not random in terms of the geography of population decline. So the orange circles do tend to cluster and they cluster in a few different ways. They cluster in the middle of our country, so our former industrial belt. Uh, and so you'll notice that in Michigan, for example, which is probably what you would be most um, familiar with in terms of population decline in the United States, but then also throughout um, northern Ohio and then New York, we see a cluster of decline. In the south, we also see cities losing population. This is a story that in the US we do not tell. We don't talk about population decline in the south. I think we're, we tend to have a um, an instinctive interest more in places that are white, non-Hispanic that are shrinking and not necessarily African-American that are shrinking. But the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that we actually see clusters of cities that are increasing in population paired with cities that are decreasing in population. So that it's a, a part of this is, is the changing the changing sorting of people across metropolitan areas or urban agglomerations. That is that certain kinds of people prefer to live in certain kinds of cities, but everyone is working within the same labor market. But of course, cities compete for people because people who live inside the city pay taxes to those cities. So the cities that are able to attract the more educated and the people who make more money will end up better off than those that tend to attract those who are less educated. So if you look in California, for example, you'll see that we have lots of cities growing very rapidly paired with cities that are losing population during this time period. Now there are lots of ways that we could measure decline. And I should say that in the US in particular, this is not something that the social sciences have spent very much time looking at. In fact, so far urban decline really has fallen squarely within the domain of planners. So this is something that urban and regional planners have tended to look at, but not something that even geographers have given any consideration to. Because I am a, more of a demographer, I'm much more interested in, in population decline, decreases in numbers of people over a particular time period. But we could also look at decreases in jobs. Uh, often planners will look at occupied housing units, so how many apartments or houses stand empty. This is actually the decline that you can see when you drive down the street, so it's a very important way to look at decline. Or we could just look at vacancies in general, right? So how many buildings stand empty, right? How many more buildings are there empty now than there were 10 years ago? Now, measuring decline as with measuring increase, is completely dependent both on the geographical unit and the temporal scale. So were I to choose any other set of years to look at in terms of population decline, we would get a different picture, right? Uh, and so this is tricky because it means that developing policy is, a, is not as straightforward as we would like it to be because we're, we don't really know whether a place is declining or if it's, it depends on the, the unit that we've chosen and the time period we've chosen. So I state from the outset that I'm looking only at cities, and I will, in my conclusions, talk about why this is problematic, and looking only at the past 10 years. So this is a short time period. But I would argue that when you see large declines over 10 years, this is something worth taking note of. This is important. If, if a city can lose 15% of its population in 10 years, um, 
I think that that's relevant. As I said, most, mostly in the US, when we look at population decline, this has come from planners. And the nice thing about planners is that they're interested in policy. So they're interested in trying to figure out what we do about population decline. How do we manage this? How do we fix the problem? And one large stream of policy in, in planning has taken the strategy of not looking to increase the numbers. That is, there's no going back for many of these cities. They will never be as large as they once were. It's not a question of marketing your city and attracting people. It's a question of adapting to the change, which is inevitable, right? And so we refer to this as smart shrinkage, or sometimes it's referred to as right-sizing of cities. And you, if you're interested in this topic, you may have read about some of these strategies because they have to do with managing infrastructure, services, and housing such that the city can continue to function and be livable for the people who are still there. And this has to do with blight. If you live on a street where half of the houses are empty, not only will you have a very difficult time selling your house, but also nobody is keeping these houses up, right? So people squat in them crime rates go up, they don't look nice, right? So that cities try to figure out a way to manage for the smaller population and still provide the services that people need. I like this because it's a very spatial approach. So geographers, of course, we care about space. And so this is a very nice way to think about managing decline, right? And the key argument, I think, can be summarized as the idea that depopulation, so population decline, and a high quality of life can coexist. Those who are left behind don't necessarily need to suffer. Now, I think, because I'm a demographer, that another way we could measure smart shrinkage or smart decline would be to simply look at the kind of people who are left and the kind of people who choose to come to these places. So that it's not only whether or not a population is declining over time, but also who's leaving and who's coming. Right? So that if a place remains attractive to those who are possessors of a high degree of human capital, so the college educated, then there's something about that city that remains attractive. Right? And of course, from, from a tax-based perspective, the cities would be happy to attract these sorts of people. Now, there are two things that I think that we can think about here. One is that human capital, of course, is an engine of economic growth. People with, with a college education uh, contribute a certain certain something to the economy. But I'm more interested in the second, which is more of a Richard Florida argument, that dy dynamic places, right? Places that are attracting the college, college educated, they must, be, they must be interesting. Maybe they have something that we can't see. That's not visible to us. All we see is the population decline. But when people have a choice, when they can vote with their feet and they choose to come to these places, then these places are worth paying attention to. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I've covered the background, I think, more or less. I'll talk a little bit about my data, because as always, in this sort of research, the data are, are problematic. And then I'm just going to show you some tables and show you several more maps, right? And everything that I'm doing here is looking at the interaction between population change and the change in educational attainment, the change in human capital stock within a city uh, over this 10-year period. All right, so what I care about is this interaction between population change and human capital change, which means that it's, and I had not thought about this, but another interesting question is what about the cities that grow very quickly but see declines in their human capital stock? Those are also very interesting places because we would expect that uh, holding everything else constant, places that are growing should also be seeing increases in their, increases in their human capital stock. Okay, and then I'll offer some preliminary conclusions. Okay, so the data that I use for population are very straightforward because we count, in theory, everyone every 10 years in the United States. So looking at whether or not a city has, has grown or declined over that period, that is very straightforward. Okay, where things get a little bit more tricky is that if we want to measure educational attainment, we don't actually have good data for that anymore. And we really don't have any data for migration. So in a perfect world, what we would do is look at where people go, people, people who are endowed with a college education, where they choose to move. Do they choose to move into cities that are losing population? But we cannot measure that at the city level. Okay, so what we do instead is look at the percent of the population that had a college degree in 2000 and the percent that has a college degree in 2010. Demographically, this, this is very tricky. Um, so what I'm going to show you is a first cut. And then in my conclusions, I'll talk a little bit about uh, refinements that need to be done. Another thing is that if we look at just the population 25 and older, which is how, in the United States, how we always look at educational attainment, we're mixing the demographic change, so cohort change, 
right? That is that we educate more people over time. So we're, we're going to mix cohort change with the actual attraction of a city. So what I'm going to focus on here is the, is the, is the change that's occurring in the population 25 to 34 because we're not dramatically increasing more people in that age cohort over time. So cities that see large increases in that group really are attracting them. But also these are the people who really are footloose. They often don't have children yet. They made out of, formed a household, so they have the freedom to go where they want to go. These are the people that I'm interested in looking at. And I think I have to move very quickly here. What I just want to say here is that when we talk about population increase in the United States, the, on average, the highest rates of increase are in our smallest cities. So those that are 100,000 to 250,000, our largest cities are really big, right? So they're growing, but they're not growing at the rates of our smaller cities. Uh, on average in 2000, about a quarter of our population had at least a college degree. We expect cities to be more educated, right? Because people who are educated tend to congregate in cities. And what I want to focus on here is just two points on the bottom table. One is that if you look at the college educated uh, 25 to 34, you'll see that although the largest cities are not the fastest growing, on the whole they attract more college educated. They've seen a bigger increase in percentage points in the, in the number of people who are college educated. Whereas those who are 65 plus have seen the biggest increases have come in the smaller cities. I wish I had more time. I'm going to move very quickly here. On this map we have uh, educational attainment uh, by age cohort, and all I want to point out here is that there's a lot of geographical variation across the country in terms of the share of the population that has a college degree. And that in some of the places, if you look in the, in the Midwest where we saw population decline, for the population 25 to 34, many of these cities actually are fairly well educated and they're not losing a lot of their educated population. Okay, if we look here, anywhere you see an orange circle, this is where we had a decrease and the percent of the population that was college educated. Now, this is really moving against the flow. For a place to lose a share of population that's college educated, you really, only a few things could happen. For example, you could have lots of international immigration. You could be a, an immigration destination where most of your migrants are not college educated. But if you're looking at, at internal migration, or you could have high natural increase. But on the whole, places should be increasing their human capital stock because over generations we educate more and more people. Right? So to lose human capital, you really have to work at the city level. This takes effort. It doesn't happen by accident. And what I'm interested in here is the, is the cities that were declining and also seeing a loss in their share of educated population versus those that are declining but see an increase in human capital stock. Right? So these are our largest cities. Right? And New Orleans actually is a very good example here. So New Orleans between 2000 and 2010 lost a third of its population. It's an unusual city because it lost its population because of Hurricane Katrina. So many people left and they did not come back. This is unusual um, in, in terms of an explanation for population decline. Uh, but if you look at the percent of the population that's college educated, in this key 25 to 34 age cohort, they actually saw an increase of 11 percentage points over this 10 year period. So what happens is that they lose the bottom. The bottom leaves and the educated come in so that we, the, the city shrinks, but we see a transformation in terms of the kind of people who are still in the city. If I were a city planner or if I were managing the budget for a city, I would be much less concerned about this. Right? If we pair that then with, it, with cities like Detroit or Flint, right? Detroit loses a quarter of its population between 2000 and 2010. And this is following decades of population decline. So this is only one decade of population decline, but it's following declines year on year pretty much for the last 40 years or so. But you'll notice for this percent college educated that they see a decrease in the share of the population that's college educated. So they're bleeding people, but they're bleeding human capital as well. This is problematic, right? We see the same thing for Birmingham, Alabama, but then you look at a city like, say, Buffalo, which I haven't highlighted here, or Pittsburgh, and you see that they lose population, but they attract those with lots of college education. Okay, I'll move very quickly here. All I wanted to point out here was that for Chicago, which is the only very large city in the US to lose population, we see something similar to what we would see for other attractive cities, which is that they lose population. This is like um, New Orleans, but they're very attractive to those with a college education. 
I will move very quickly through this. I'm very happy to talk to you about this later if you're interested. But there are all these different ways that population change and human capital change can interact. Right? And so my expectation was that if you lose people, you lose college educated. But actually, that's rare. Uh, most of the time, you're still gaining in human capital. And I'll just move through here. And here, I just want to point out the blue circles. These are those that lost population and lost in terms of share of the educated. And the pink circles, right? those that lost population but gained in terms of the share of the populations that is highly educated. So I think from a policy perspective, these two different kinds of cities are very interesting to look at because I, I would expect to see different outcomes over time with them. OK, last slide. I, moved, I, I mentioned this very briefly, but the age cohort, the demography of this is really important because if your age structure changes in your city over 10 years, so you become much more attractive to, say, younger or middle-aged people, they're going to be more educated than those who are really young or those who are really old because, well, because they're, they're not college educated. So we're not capturing the fact that the demographic structure changes in a place and that this drives some of the increases in human capital stock that we see. Geography matters as well. It's one thing to talk about smaller cities growing very quickly. I think it's really important to look at how close they are to other cities. Because a lot of this, I think, is gentrification, suburbanization, or urban agglomerations. That is, that cities are all working together, and that there's sorting occurring across these sets of cities. Um, so then the future, I'm going to deal with the cohort migration effect thing, because I think it's really important to get at what's actually going on in terms of human capital stock changes, and then look at additional geographies. Thank you for your patience.